This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us. I am James Just. In the middle is John Cameron. On the other end is Richard Fields. Gentlemen, we are running down to the final week or so of the election. Oh, actually, by the time Man, I our gotta vote. audience mm -hmm. sees this, it'll be like four days, four or five days. So why are the both the Democrats and Republicans beholden to the military industrial complex and everything that's kind of attached to it? Actually, uh, Libertarian candidate Joe Jorgensen uh, has an article just published uh, that really, really does an excellent job of explaining uh, why both Democrats and Republicans are beholden to the military industrial complex. And it boils down to something very simple. The military industrial complex gen uh, uh, donates significant, huge amounts of money to both uh, Republicans and center left Democrats. So if you want to uh, get the support of the huge campaign donations that uh, come from uh, the military industrial uh, behemoths, you have to toe the line and you can't do anything that will end their uh, pipeline to uh, never ending uh, sales and profits. It's, it's really that simple. Um, and if you can take a look at, at the, uh, the, the candidates who have not received uh, mainstream press, mainstream uh, establishment backing, look no further than Tulsi Gabbard, who uh, was the only anti-war Democrat on the stage during the Democratic primaries and was shunned. Look no farther than Ron Paul, who was the only uh, anti-war uh, candidate on the stage during 2008 and 2012 uh, primary debates. And he was uh, well, lambasted by the lambasted by the uh, by the uh, uh, by the press and by the uh, establishment. He had, you know, he, he got no traction at all in the mainstream. Yeah, I I think um, one of the things I didn't think about that that I an article is good when it makes you think. And gives you information and mentioned a number which I, I feel is kind of small is twenty nine million dollars in political uh, contributions to Canada, but that that pales in comparison to the blackmail over uh, pulling a base, um, you know, from your state. Like, uh, you know, California was a, a net recipient of way more than you know the money that was taken out by the Fed back. Uh, when they were in the fold, and then when when California went Republican, uh, elected some Republican um, uh, senators, and the the makeup of the the Congress changed, you know, you had uh, uh, federal money fleeing. Um, I don't know what it what it's like now, but threatening to close a military base with like thirty thousand jobs, for example, here in Sacramento, we've lost like. 50,000 military jobs over the last 20 years or so with base closures. And then you have the <clears throat> plants in Southern California, which are almost no longer there. They're in other places around the country uh, producing these weapons of war. And you have the shipyards and you have, you know, all of that stuff, the hospitals that take care of the vets and, and all the businesses that depend on them. And, um, you know, that number is thrown around uh, a lot about you know why it's important to keep that money spent, but I think the numbers show uh, pretty squarely that if you leave uh, the the taxpayer with the tax money in their pocket to spend as they see fit, the multiplier effect is way more. And one thing the article didn't mention, and maybe it did, and I didn't didn't read it well enough, is that um, there's this constant interchange between you know uh, like uh, government sacks, people from government sacks go into government and they're in these treasury positions and they're in advisory roles and they're on panels and they're on think tanks and back and forth and back and forth and they're all self-serving. You know it's like the uh, the committee that hands out the Nobel prizes and the Rhodes Scholarship and everything else. You know they're they're controlled by people who have a vested interest of keeping the ball rolling in the same direction. And and uh, the my last thing, and then I promise I'll I'll stop, is that you know the the fallout of us going into places and waging war is pretty bad. But then the we there's that fallout. But then the fallout of us leaving, like you know leaving Afghanistan. I'm not saying we should stay. Um, I just feel sorry for the thousands of people who are going to be beheaded, and some already are 
who were stupid enough to cast their lot with Americans um, uh, trying to fight, you know, medieval uh, murdering savages, thinking that, you know, we would, we would see the fight out and now we're leaving and they're all going to die. So it's a, it's a mess. And, 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 uh, you know, I'm glad that we have two rather significant uh, geographic barriers. Well, four, if you count Mexico and Canada to people invading us. And I think maybe it's time for us just to stop spending that money elsewhere and uh, give it back to the taxpayer to spend so that we have a, a booming world again. Yeah, I mean, the add-on point to, to, what, to what you were making uh, as far as uh, spending money in every congressional district, the, the defense uh, companies, the Lockheeds and the Grumman's and the Raytheon's and so on, have been extremely clever in making sure that every congressional district in the country, uh, almost without exception, has some sort of a military base making the representative in that uh, uh, in that particular district beholden to uh, keeping the the uh, the warfare spending going because otherwise hey they'll lose the base and you mm -hmm. don't want that to happen uh, mm -hmm. and of course if it did happen the uh, we you know we look at Mather we look at McClellan just here in Sacramento and see that those bases have been put to much more productive use than was the case when they were uh, military bases now, and Mather, you know, Mather uh, is be, because of you know some skullduggery with uh, with the controlling interests um, out at uh, Sacramento Municipal. Is it called Sacramento International still? I guess it is. Airport. Uh, Mather would be a much much better hub to fly people out of, and it's got some huge runways because it used to touch and goes B fifty twos there, and you know, and great hangars and all the rest of that. But it's prevented by some some backroom dealing from from uh, having any uh, passenger service flying in and out of there. It's only cargo. So, you know, the the, the fallout when you let these clowns uh, control things and let it instead of letting the market control them is pretty significant. And then you have another, you know, uh, airfield at McClellan that's that's huge. And and uh, so, you know, lots of benefit to turning those fully loose as centers for for commerce and and travel than than keeping them to the side yeah i mean there's we we see uh uh you know dallas chicago all of these uh, large cities have more than one uh, airport competing with each other there's no reason why we can't have something competing with sacramento international airport particularly considering that it's uh, a half an hour to an hour away from most parts of sacramento yeah. and mcclellan and mather are right right net right right next door sort of like yeah. love versus dfw yeah, it's not like we don't have other cities. LAX has is right in the center of LA. It's not like uh, airports in the middle of cities are a strange thing. And this the industrial complex, it's actually bigger than most people think. These military industrial complexes or all the various industrial complexes that are attached to the to the government spending, whether it's homeless industrial complex, the educational industrial complex. That's, that's the big one. That's the one I wanted somebody to touch on. I'm glad you touched on it. Uh, There's it, it's yeah. crazy how much how much uh, skullduggery goes on there, and how many fat salaries are created. Eighteen percent annual growth in administrative costs in in universities in California. Layer upon layer upon layer of people inventing jobs and getting paid for doing so. And, and let's not forget about the uh, medical industrial complex, which yeah. is fully responsible for uh, raising the cost of healthcare from uh, four percent of GDP. Uh, prior to uh, prior to Medicare, Medicaid, and all the rest, to eighteen percent now. It's uh, you know when you have one buyer, uh, Medicare for all would be the absolute worst possible thing as far as the cost of health care. When you have one buyer, that buyer is going to be paying a lot more money. Yeah, particularly yeah. if the government is the one yeah. buyer. Go no, wait a second. Government is great. On I hear they got some great deals on hammers and toilet seats. Um, I think they got a hammer for only like $4,200 and a toilet seat for, I think, 11000 I mean, you can't get that kind of – oh, yeah, you can. Never mind. We're talking about government corruption. We're going to kind of move on here. This, The Washington – no, the Inquisitor actually ran a story that the Hunter Biden story is failing to land. And they're, they're, asking, they're, they're answering is why is this kind of not landing the same reason the Trump tapes didn't land four years ago. It's kind of everybody expects it. Nobody cares. But it's hard for a story to land if the media is not covering it and social media is kind of silencing it, essentially. 
Yeah. Yeah, you'd think. Actually, I think the fact that uh, the that social media and the mainstream media uh, either belittled or ignored the New York Post story has actually given the story more legs than it would have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what's really going on uh, is that the uh, body politic has become so tribal, so either uh, gung ho MAGA red or gung ho never Trump blue that anything that detracts from that uh, tribal storyline uh, is simply ignored by the partisans on either side. Yeah, and absolutely. And and the, the difference between the media focus on the Steele dossier, which we're now finding was uh, basically created by Hillary Trump. She went out looking for somebody to create. Hillary Clinton, you mean? Yeah, Hillary Clinton, sorry. it's They're all the same. See, and that's it. You really want to upset one of these Republicans <laughs> is talk to them about how their their policies are exactly the same except for on one or two issues that only two percent of the electorate electorate cares about and they get they get incensed because they the, you talked about tribalism you know it's uh reminds me of that that uh, uh star trek story where there was hatred between these two races and they both had like one half of their face white and one half of their face black. It's just, they were on the other side. And so, um, you know, we got that going on and, and, you know, we talk about it on the show over and over again. If you get people afraid and, and upset, they're, they're pretty easy to manipulate. You know, when people are, are emotionally removed from things, they start actually turning on their, their, their thinking brain, which they're not doing now. No, it's so everything's so tied up in emotion. It's vote blue, no, no, what? Vote blue, no matter who. And then you've got the the Trump guys who are, you know, Trump is like some messiah for them at the moment. And you, and it's it is it's almost it's religious fervor. And anything that's against that's not for me is heresy. It's the well, and, and there's a, and there's a good reason for that. When you politicize decision making you move away from win-win solutions. If you or, not, you or I decide to, uh, you know, if I want to go to work for you, uh, John, uh, and you want to pay me five cents an hour, uh, and I agree to five that cents much? an hour, that's, that's a win-win situation for both of us because I'm, I'm willingly doing it. Mm -hmm. But if the government says, no, you can't work for anything less than $15 an hour, and you think I'm not worth $15 an hour, which is eminently true, then uh, <laughs> you are forcing me into unemployment uh, and that's a win lose. Uh, that's, no, that's you're worth, you're worth at least 1501, <laughs> Richard. Least. That's the difference between government, you know, political decision making and yeah. private sector decision making. Yeah. Private sector is win win. Both parties to an agreement agree to it and benefit from it. Political decision making is win lose. One side is going to lose. And that's why elections become so called most important election in history because mm. half the country is going to win or half the country is going to lose, depending on. Uh, who gets elected? Yeah. It's uh, it's uh, you know the over right, overarching argument for making government not a part of most economic decisions and making government entirely uh, smaller than it is, dealing only with uh, matters of uh, national security and and uh, police and courts and not much else. Yeah, well, yeah. I would say go ahead, James. I well, a lot of people are talking to me about the toxic nature of politics. How come everything is political? And it's says, well, the more responsibility you give government, the more things are political because now they become, rather than an issue between people, they're an issue between the government. And that makes it politics. You can't have it both ways. You can't have a public policy and not have it be political. It's just, you can't do it. And so the more, the more we get government involved, the more we get government involved and the more fights we're going to have. It's just the nature of the beast. And so if you want a less political life, you have to have a less political life. There's literally no way around it. Hmm. Which means which means less government involved. Hmm. Yeah. Well, so I, government, I would, maybe maybe the politics. suggestion is instead of red or blue, let's vote red, white, and blue. Jorgensen. Yeah, or gold, as they put it. Yeah, yeah gold. That'll work. All right, so we're going to move back on. California power problems. The wind is blowing heavily outside my window this morning. And there's uh, some of my friends that are sitting there without power because PG&E shutoffs to, you know, to prevent uh, fires. And yet we got the governor wanting to go to, you know, all electric cars by in 15 years, which is a bold 
goal to begin with. But mm-hmm. when we can't even have enough power and the power isn't stable, I don't understand what they're trying to do. You, you're mm-hmm. putting the cart before the horse. Well, I think all, all electric, uh, I, I still, Richard laughs at my, 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 I, I've got to do some research on the number of uh, installed solar panels. And then once I do, we'll, I'll throw down that gauntlet on the next show. But all these things that, that people want to do, like solar power, wind power, um, have a huge issue that they haven't figured out. And I don't know what they're going to back them up with unless they go nuke. If, if, if we want to end, uh, you know, gasoline power next week, I'm fine. But, but bury me a nice little nuclear uh, power plant, you know, within a stone's throw of my house so I can charge my electric car and I don't have to worry about waiting for the sun to shine or the wind to blow to run the batteries up. So, um, and the market needs to make those decisions because when, you know, the reason nuclear power isn't uh, something you can carry around in your pocket and it could be is because government got involved and, and um, you know, assumed the uh, liability for all these nuclear power plants way earlier than they should have gone online and then uh, over-regulated them so that they could make no improvements in them. And so, you know, the idea that some, some lunatic who's elected without, to my knowledge, any kind of scientific education whatsoever is going to decide to uh, turn the infrastructure and billions of dollars and millions of jobs upside down on a whim uh, is, is insane. But the idea, you know, we have <laughs> um, in, in England, um, I, I read a, a, uh, a BBC little sidebar, and they were talking about power as the hurricane hits um, uh, uh, one of our hurricanes, one of our mini hurricanes hit Louisiana or something. They were commenting on the fact that 4 million people were, were without electricity. And they said, well, that's because in the U.S. They, they, they string electrical cables up on poles above ground like you, you would put out so much laundry to dry. So in other places... Uh, when, when the wind blows, they don't care because the electrical power is all being carried for the most part in underground cables. Uh, so, you know, I mean, there are solutions to all of this stuff and, and having the government yeah, and get I, out I, of it is the best thing. Yeah. I, I, think, I think the best thing to do is to draw an analogy, an analogy between the nuclear power industry and the uh, uh, software, hardware, the, you know, the internet, uh, the information age. The information age, the hardware, the software, all of the thought processes that went into creating the internet were by and large uh, happened in a totally unregulated uh, marketplace. Uh, and nuclear, on the other hand, was created uh, created by government uh, in Los Alamos and was never allowed to be created in an unregulated. It was always, it was, it was regulated with with a, an iron fist from day one mm-hmm. and it's the regulation that is causing the uh is the reason why nuclear has not been allowed to, to uh progress and become uh safe and uh, uh all pervasive as and as, and as lack of regulation has allowed the information age the uh mm-hmm. the internet to become uh pervasive the, inter- the, the, the internet never would exist with the kind of regulation that the uh, nuclear industry had to, uh, had to uh, withstand. Mm. Uh, there are nuclear technologies available today that are both safe, totally safe, and uh, feasible. Uh, you can bet that regulation won't let them get a foothold anytime soon because there are interests, oil and gas interests, solar interests, uh, wind interests, all kinds of uh, lobbying forces that will want to keep a cap on any kind of competition, and that's uh, that that is, is competition that creates the uh, the incentive and and the and the uh, the ability for various kinds of uh, energy to become uh, viable, particularly in this case nuclear. And the other thing that we're looking at with uh, the the winds is that we're looking at uh, we've talked about this before. We're looking at a, a huge amount of uh, fuel on the forest floor that is sitting there uh, having accumulated for centuries, well, not centuries, for the, for the last 50 to 100 years, so uh, almost yeah. a century, yeah. to, uh, you know, to uh, 
be, be lit by sparks from these above ground uh, power lines. And then I want to add something to that. And then I want to talk about uh, what you just said, Richard, the, the fuel thing. I, I tried to do an internet search, not a Google Scholar search, but a standard Google um, search for the relationship between fuel on the ground and um, uh, the intensity and duration and size of fires. And what came up first was when I did the search in Google, was the one paper out there that debunked the importance of fuel in creating all these fires. The one paper that said that the amount of fuel, I mean, you throw a match on the floor and there's just my tile floor there, not gonna burn. It'll burn itself out. Throw some gasoline on it, I'm gonna have something I gotta deal with. But the one paper that came up when I did the Google search, was the one that said that that fuel didn't have any importance. And this is going to be hugely important in this election when all of these social media platforms and everything are con controlling the news cycle. I mean, it's, well, and they're in effect right? controlled by government because they have to kowtow or they will come under the regulatory burden that uh, nuclear has faced for the, you know, for the, ever since World War II. Yeah. yeah, well, I have to remind everybody that Facebook's latest change was done to stay in compliance. With law, their less their changes that they're doing are to be, be, remain in compliance. So well, well yeah, you know, or or to or to avert further legislation or regulation yeah. that will make their life even more difficult. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we we like to say, or I like to say that uh, Facebook and Twitter and and all the rest of the uh, media platforms are uh, you know operating as private enterprises and should be allowed to censor however much they want, but. The problem with that is that they are being forced to censor by the threat of regulation and or, uh, well, regulation primarily, or, yeah. or more or lawsuit. uh, invasive laws. Like to, to lawsuits. They're also open to lawsuits. They're avoiding the potential lawsuits. That's yeah. basically from California. I think from Germany, There's they're getting a bunch of pushback from California, I believe, Germany. And so they just yeah. said, well, the hell with it. They're not even, after the election, they're just going to stop taking... Um, ads for social and political causes so if you're a likely you want, story likely so, story they'll take they'll take ads for i would say the man boy love association if the pay was good enough but they probably wouldn't do that because they'd get in trouble but anything up to that they'll take the money well they won't take money for me after november 3rd no? as, a, as a political candidate they won't take money for me for after november 3rd well after november 3rd you won't have to worry about it because you're going to get elected so yeah. You know. <laughs> well, we can hope about that. All right. So before we go, the media is finally noticing Cal Exit. I finally saw an article in the Sacramento Bee. In the Bee is, of all places. In the Bee of all places that is talking about all these people leaving California. And they actually did a somewhat decent job about telling why. I mean, of course, they kind of blew the analysis, but at least the base reason that, you know, the politics is kind of gone wonky. It's, in, it's impossible to live here in, in expense. And so people are just leaving. If you wanted to raise a family, people are just leaving. Yeah, John and I have personal experience with that. We used to uh, raise money for a libertarian slash conservative uh, public interest uh, outfit. And the uh, people that we talked to, the donors to this libertarian slash conservative uh, outfit, would very frequently uh, tell me, hey, I'm on my way out of town. I'm moving to, I had one guy. Uh, who owned uh, a fencing company in Southern California, say, I'm moving to, in his case, Wyoming, uh, just as soon as I can get my, get out of here, as soon as I can sell my house. I had another guy say, you know, I'm very seriously looking at moving my manufacturing plant from Los Angeles to wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, and and people are, are not only talking about it, they're actually doing it. And yeah. so we're yeah. looking at, at, at conservatives who don't want to be, belittled by being Trump supporters or whatever, or libertarians who feel totally lost in the wilderness, uh, or anybody that doesn't follow the, you know, the green progressive uh, Democratic Party line uh, being ostracized by their friends and neighbors. They're saying, hey, I don't have to put up with this. I can go to Utah. I can go to Wyoming. I can go to uh, Idaho. I can go to uh, Texas, and I, I'll feel right at home. Mm. Uh, the, the sad part about it for California is a lot of these people are the most productive and beneficial and tax producing uh, people in the state. Mm 
So not only is, is California losing uh, losing people, losing uh, uh, to out migration of, of people in general, but we're losing losing our best and brightest. And, yeah, and then and the people unfortunately, keep the keep the, the, keep the, the state uh, viable. Yeah, yes, I knew that. Unfortunately, the people that are most negatively impacted are the ones that can't move. You know, if you earn, own a restaurant, yeah. if you own uh, a farm, if you own timber, if you own vineyards, if you own the biggest single industry, here's your quiz for the day, folks. And there's no points if you, if you don't get this right. What is the single uh, highest revenue producing industry in the state of California? Agriculture. 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 All right. Everybody knows that. And what is the one business that is basically becoming more and more impossible to be in? Um, starving for water uh, because of a, a fish that's not even native. Um, and uh, on and on and on and on. And, you know, I think last time I checked, oh, wait, I, my stomach is telling me I need food. So does the rest of California. So does the rest of the country. Which reminds me, it's past lunchtime. Yeah, well, so we, we should end the show. And, and uh but, but, you know, it's just, you know, the countries have done this and, and I haven't seen a state do it to itself, a state in the United States of America, but California is, is killing itself. And, and well, California, Illinois, and New York are all doing yeah, it to themselves. Yeah. And if you look at the, on a national level, you can see uh, Venezuela, uh, largest oil reserves in the world, Norway, is Norway the one that's got the huge uh, pension yep. fund? Yeah. yeah. Norway, uh, way smaller oil reserves. Well, Which they have country, oil reserves offshore, but they, yeah. They have oil reserves offshore, but they're, they're a fraction of what Venezuela is sitting on. Mm -hmm. You have hyperinflation, people rioting, no food in stores. In, no gas at the pump. No gas at the pump, having to bring oil and gas in. Through Iran, of all places. Through Iran. And in Norway, you have a $17 trillion or something like that uh, pension fund for folks when they retire paid for basically all out of oil and investments after that. What's the difference? Government, uh, a, a capitalist, even though the people here try to say it's, it's socialist, it is not. There's some hardcore, hardcore capitalists in Norway, and proudly so, versus socialist. And that that's a lesson to be learned. You know, bad government or even good government is should be kept in a little tiny tiny box and and let out every once in a while just to do what's absolutely necessary and then stuff back in there so it can't do any damage. And that's yeah, what we're gonna end the show. I, sorry, like I let my dog out to go pee once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. We're we're gonna end the show on that one. We're out of here. Go to libertariancounterpoint.com to find us, and you can find us on all the various podcast networks now and and on all various social media things. You guys know how to find us. Thank you for watching. And from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, uh, please remember to love everybody. Oh, thank you very much for, for having me on, James. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.